So now I would like to invite Gailey Malafin, the former mayor of Richmond. She's around here and she's going to introduce the next, the next keynote speaker. Well, hello, everyone. This is a little bit high for me. There we go. <laughs> okay, so hello, everyone. Hope the conference is going great. I'm sure it is. I had an opportunity to be here yesterday, and as many of you know, I'm the former mayor here in Richmond, and I'm very proud that uh, having this conference, this Soil Not Oil conference in Richmond began um, while I was mayor, so uh, I'm glad it's continuing. And uh, so... So um, we have many great speakers today. As you know, you've had uh, an opportunity to uh, likely ha hear from some already about environmental justice to organic farming, sustainable fishing, carbon sequestration, reforestation, water conservation, protection of bees, public land, and seed integrity. Well, today we have a very special treat. We have with us as a keynote speaker, a visitor, a visiting progressor, progressive from Ver the state of Vermont, David Zuckerman, who was elected Lieutenant Governor of his state last fall after leading the Bernie Sanders inspired Vermont Progressive Party for many years. And in his successful third party candidacy against a conservative Republican, David played up his own past connection to causes and campaigns in line with this conference. And in addition, he is a working organic farmer um, who can be found on any Saturday morning in Burlington, Vermont, peddling his own vegetables in the state's largest farmer's market. David is a graduate of the University of Vermont and a 20-year member of the state legislature. He helped lead the fight for the nation's first GMO labeling law and more recent efforts to legalize local cannabis production and sale in Vermont. Right. He also championed workers' rights, paid sick days, minimum wage increases, single-payer health co uh, coverage, and reform of the state's regressive tax structure. And these are all ca causes that many of us uh, here in California have championed as well. And as my friend and colleague in the Richmond Progressive Alliance, Steve Early, who invited David to be here with us at this conference, as Steve tells us, Bernie Sanders has called David the most progressive lieutenant governor in the country. And so I am so honored to, I want to just let you know, I'm really honored to be doing a workshop later on this afternoon at 4.30 with David. And it's called Working Coast to Coast, Making Cities and States Sustainable Free from Oil Dependency. And tomorrow we have a house party. Many of you know I'm also running for California Lieutenant Governor as an independent. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I hope to be the second independent lieutenant governor after David. Um, and we're having a house party that David's going to be speaking at, and it's, uh, we're going to hopefully raise some funds for my campaign um, tomorrow at 2 o'clock at uh, Steve Early's house. So if people can make it, his address is 747 Lobos Avenue in Point Richmond. So hope to see you there. But right now, I am so thrilled that we have David with us as our keynote speaker. So without much ado, let me please join me um, in welcoming David to Richmond and to the stage. David. Thank you, Thank you, Gail. <laughs> Thank you Gail. So I'll... Uh, make my own makeshift podium here to put my papers on. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me, Steve and Gail, for the introduction and for all of you for being here for these couple days and not just here these couple days, but for the day-to-day -day work that many of you do around uh, agricultural uh, sustainability and practices that are regenerative, uh, activism and democracy and fighting 
for so many of the issues that we have in common uh, that I'll get into in a moment. Because sometimes when I speak to a group like this, I think, why am I speaking to you any more than you speaking to me when we are all in this together and we all have such different aspects of experience that we can really give to each other. And so a conference like this, to me, is about the workshops and the speakers, but also the in-between time where we exchange information, we exchange excitement, we exchange energy so we can keep on the struggle and keep on the fight, which, you know, sometimes is a little bit feeling like it's uphill. And uh, events like this help us obviously recognize that none of us are doing this alone. We're all in it together. Uh, and so I really want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I don't, I don't know that uh, there's any other statewide official other than Senator Tester, U.S. Senator, that's also an organic farmer. So in introducing myself, I just want to say I'm also an organic farmer. I raise about 30 acres of organic vegetables. We raise about 1,000 chickens on pasture on our clover cover crops, moving them twice a day. Uh, and then we also raise uh, organic pigs, raising about 70 piglets to sell in the spring. And then we farrow again in the fall and keep about 30 for um, raising through to the summer. And uh, I am a bit of an opportunivore. Uh, I eat what's in front of me. Uh, I will admit that. Um, because sometimes when you're on the run, if you're overly picky, uh, you, you get hungry. And I, I can't go without food. Um, so uh, I want to give you a little political background. I was a cynical young person. I still am slightly cynical, but not as much as I used to be. Uh, going to the University of Vermont, and I was very involved in environmental justice and environmental activism causes. And I was a, a fairly privileged Boston area kid going to a very white state, white university, uh, studying environmental studies and, and chemistry issues. And, uh, you know, life was, was relatively smooth sailing. Uh, and I was pretty cynical about the political process and the two parties and corporate money and politics. And this is back in the early 90s. Uh, and obviously, that's gotten a lot worse. Uh, but I, I became interested in politics and electoral politics because of this person that now nobody is unfamiliar with, of course, which is Bernie Sanders, who was then congressman in Vermont. And uh, he was an independent then, uh, just as he is an ind independent senator now. And uh, he was someone who simply spoke the truth, spoke his values, spoke his beliefs. He didn't hold back. Uh, to try to sound politic for everybody and not ruffle any feathers and, um, and wasn't taking corporate donations. And so I volunteered for him and I was just someone who knocked on doors and registered voters and did the work that so many of you, I think, did in this last you know, year and a half or two. And uh, thank you for that because what an amazing difference in this country with his having been in that race. And, uh, and it opened my eyes, and I met a number of local people, much like the Richmond Progressive Alliance. There was an organization called the Progressive Coalition in Burlington, Vermont, that formed as Bernie was independent mayor in the 80s. And lo and behold, it was people that cared about affordable housing, that cared about uh, workplace safety issues and dignity in the workplace, that cared about economic justice, that cared about environmental justice. We have a public electric utility in Burlington, one of the first in the country to be 100% renewable energy. It was a community of people that thought issues were more important than party. And that all was the group that was supporting people like Bernie and others. And a few years after volunteering for a number of people, they asked me to run. And in 1994, I did run. Uh, I lost uh, for the state house by 59 votes, um, but that was uh, the beginning. And I ran again two years later and won. And as Gail said, I served uh, for 18 of the last 20 years in the House uh, and then in the Senate for four of those years. And then last fall, while we were all crying in our beers in November, um, or soda or juice or whatever you were crying into, um, I got elected Lieutenant Governor of Vermont, and so I was sort of celebrating, but I was also depressed. <laughs> During that time, I also uh, farmed for other people. From 94 to 98, I worked for other farmers, and in 99, I started my own farm, Full Moon Farm, with just a couple acres as a CSA, working at the farmer's market as well. And in 2000, met my spouse, Rachel, who I would be remiss if right now I didn't thank her to you. Uh, because she is at home and she is uh, both uh, 
caring for our 11-year-old daughter while I jaunt off to California. She is also struggling with Lyme disease, uh, which went 10 years undiagnosed, uh, and we um, figured it out in about 2000, and we've been fighting to get her back since. Um, she's probably now half the person she once was, um, which is success in that uh, back in 2000, she was maybe about a quarter of the person that she once was, and she carries so much water uh, and harvests so many vegetables and helps guide so many on our crew when I'm off at political events fighting for GMO labeling, fighting for cannabis reform, fighting for workers' rights on dairy farms. And um, so really without her, uh, I would not be able to be the spokesperson I am and the organizer I am and the fighter that I am to work along with you. So I just want to thank her to all of you for that. And, um, and so in, in growing the farm, we grow about 30 acres of vegetables. And um, I was just at a conference in Burlington the last couple days, which was catalysts for a climate economy. And much of the discussion was around uh, regenerative agriculture and renewable energy and transforming you know, so many different aspects of our economy away from fossil fuels, uh, working towards carbon sequestration, trying to reverse uh, obviously the unfortunate direction that we're going right now, which obviously we are feeling all across the globe from flooding in Southeast Asia to the fires out west here to the inc incredibly massive hurricanes that have nothing to do with climate change apparently um, that are happening in you know, the South and Southeast. And uh, I, I have a, a slight comment to make that hopefully will not fall on its face, but you know, we have hurricane Harvey slamming into Texas. We have Hurricane Irma about to slam into uh, Florida after devastating our Caribbean islands and other islands and, and people just being destroyed and their lives being destroyed. Uh, and then we have Hurricane Jose, which frankly by name should be the most angry at the United States of any, uh, but instead is going to magnanimously hopefully curve away uh, and, and say, you know, we don't need to destroy each other when we disagree with each other. Uh, and so um, hopefully uh, that will, um, will, will spare most, although the people of Barbuda, I, I don't know what they did to deserve what they're getting. Um, but, uh, but we all need to be helping. And what, what I draw from all of these storms and I draw from all of the appeals for help and all of the um, scenarios including you know, hypocritical Texas senators that thought we shouldn't fund Sandy recovery, but we should fund Harvey recovery. But really, what we all have to recognize is that at some point, any one of us either currently are, or will be, or at some point in our past, either in this lifetime or in our ancestors' lifetime, were the receiver of injustice. And so, no matter what, any one of us could have been, is, or will be the receiver of injustice. And if we don't each take the responsibility when we have the opportunity to thwart injustice, then we are only hurting ourselves. And that it is our obligation and our duty as people who are privileged to be able to come together to have meetings like this, and privileged to generally have a roof over our head, to use that privilege to try to better our communities locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And um, sometimes that means sacrifice. But in the grand scheme of things, what many of us are sacrificing, whether we live in California or Vermont or Washington or Oregon, I've met folks from different places, we are so privileged when you look at the, the time eternal with respect to um, basic needs being met. Even when we're challenged, we are privileged compared to what most people have faced over the millennia of time. And we have opportunities to make change. We are living in a time when Bernie has reignited this incredible energy that's been settled down below the, the media radar screen and it's exploded. We have the silver lining. There is a silver lining to everything. We have the silver lining of the Trump presidency, which is that people are waking up. 
People are waking up that democracy is not just voting every two years or voting every four years, but democracy is actually participation. Democracy is deliberation. You know, it's about uh, taking maybe 15 minutes a week. You know, maybe people here do more, but when you're talking with other people who may not participate much or might be cynical or might not be interested, say, if you find half an hour, two or three times a week to go for a jog or to go for a bike ride or to go for a hike or to go walk your dog or to have dinner with friends, can you find 15 minutes a week for democracy? It's not a lot to ask, actually. If we think about the four million plus people that came out for the, the women's march in January, who participated in, in a women's march somewhere, right? It was a pretty powerful day. Uh, in, in Montpelier, Vermont, we had 20,000 people, which out here doesn't sound like a lot, but Montpelier only has about 6,000 people that live there. We shut down three highway exits, they closed them. People got out of their cars on the highways and walked into Montpelier. We, by per capita, we had the biggest march anywhere. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to speak as a newly um, uh, inaugurated lieutenant governor, but I, I, I looked out over that crowd and I thought about the millions of people across the country and the world that were coming together and thought, you know, we can do it. All of the weight of these challenges are not on any one of our shoulders. There are at least four million pairs of shoulders, and frankly, there's more people that couldn't make it because of work or weather or circumstances and family. There are millions and millions of us. And for instance, if each one of just those four million spends 15 minutes a week, that's a million hours a week of democratic action, whether it's picking up the phone and calling your city councilor, your mayor, your representative, your senator, federal or state. And if we get everybody to do that, we actually can make a difference because those numbers do matter. You know, it's not that Obamacare is the best thing that ever happened. I'm for universal single payer. There's no doubt about it. But repealing Obamacare was going to be catastrophic for millions and millions of Americans. People spoke up and we defeated that because people participated. And what we have to do is move from defeating bad things to promoting good things and making positive, effective change for people. And so, you know, that's, that's what I believe in my farming practices, in my political practices, and really my family suffers the most because of time, but in our family as well. And if we do come together and we think about all the efforts really that we've unfortunately had to do, but what we've successfully done, you know, after Charlottesville, tens of thousands of people descended on Boston. Thousands of people all over the country spoke out. When the Muslim ban was proposed, people organically flocked to the airports, and I'm assuming that happened here as well, and said, no fucking way, right? And that didn't used to happen. Maybe for some of you from the 60s it did, but in my lifetime that hasn't happened. And so we have a new energy, and we have that opportunity. We have more young people engaged. We have more economically challenged people engaged. We have people of color engaged. We have migrant people engaged. It is everybody. And when we are all walking and working in the same direction, what we are going to be able to accomplish is really pretty remarkable. Whether it's transforming our agricultural sector towards uh, regeneration and sequestration, whether it's changing our health care system, whether it's working towards raising the minimum wage and the fight for 15, these things weren't being talked about with the energy that they're being talked about today. And now's the time. It's time to take back our economy. It's time to take back our communities. It's time to take back our climate. It's time to take back our food security, our education, our law enforcement and justice system, which is currently an injustice system. And it's time to take back our democracy. Are you all part of that? Are we going to do that? So with this conference, this is a piece. Like I said, we had a conference like this in Burlington literally three days and two days and one day ago. Uh, so we do have an East Coast, West Coast thing going on, but it's happening everywhere. And if we write off communities or we write off states because of some color map that the media puts in front of us, 
then we are doing ourselves and we are doing those people an injustice. There are struggling people in every state that need a system that works for all of us, not just the few. And if we write off those states, we are writing off those people, and that's not appropriate. Frankly, I will say, Bernie would have won. And the reason Bernie would have won is that he resonated with working class people all across the country. And I would argue that the voting population that we lost in this election was, and this is gonna be an apolitic thing to say, but it was the neutered white male. And that's the person who used to get out of high school, not get a college degree, and they could get a manufacturing job and have a middle class up family to uh, feel success. That is gone. The manufacturing world is moved on because corporate America for Wall Street has moved all those jobs overseas and they're exploiting people for one or two dollars an hour or one or two dollars a day to make our shirts and make our clothes and make our phones and make our computers. Those jobs, unless we radically change our policies, are never coming back. And unless we work to make sure that what dignity is, is about being able to afford a basic standard of living and raising the minimum wage and making sure people have healthy food, we will continue to lose those voters. And so we have to recognize that we have to reach out to people that we don't always agree with or that we think we don't agree with because of the way it's portrayed with color maps on paper and recognize all that we have in common. We all want health. We all want a safe community for our kids. We all want a planet that our children are gonna be able to grow and thrive on and not get destroyed by massive storms and fires. There is a lot more that we have in common than we have in difference. But they'll have you thinking we're all fighting with each other. And we can't allow that thought process to take over how we talk and how we think and how we work. And we have to think about that at the gas station when we're filling our, our, our car, if you're filling a car unless you've got an electric car, or maybe at the grocery store or wherever you are, that striking up a conversation in line is not a bad thing to do. Don't just, the world of look down. Look at each other, smile. Create new three minute friendships. Put out the energy that you wanna receive. Those are the little things that over time are gonna snowball into bigger and bigger positive things. Say hello to the person on the street who is on unfortunate times. Don't ignore them. We have to bring our humanity back. And we bring that back through food, we bring that back through a smile. We bring that back through political action and forcing politicians to do the right thing by being vocal and by being active and by doing 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 hours, whatever it is that fits in your time budget. But it is critical that you budget that time for democracy because otherwise they're gonna run roughshod all over us. And we now have this opportunity. People are reawakened. I mean, Bernie went to Kentucky and had thousands of people in Mitch McConnell's backyard talking about health care. If Bernie can do it, so can we in our own little way. That guy has more energy, and I, I'm missing his birthday cruise today, by the way, to be here with you. He does a, a birthday bash on a ferry out on Lake Champlain with a band, and everybody dances, and it's a lot of fun. So um, that's what I'm sacrificing to be here to talk to you all. But, um, but, but he's almost 80, and he is still traveling all over the country trying to make change. So if he can do it, all of us have to do our piece. And we have to recognize that it's the people in this room and the four million people that were at the Women's March and the millions of other people that aren't in this room where if we each just take a little bit on our shoulder, it's a manageable amount. And just remind yourself of that when you get down and another ridiculous tweet comes out that A, it's a ridiculous tweet, right? Just start with that and let that just smile for a minute and be like, okay, this is not reality. This is a tweet, A. B, this person does not live in reality, has no connection to common people whatsoever, even if he uses the word love all the time, he doesn't know what the word means uh, because he wouldn't be using it the way that he does while taking the actions that he does. And we can either be depressed and angry and downtrodden over it, or we can look around this room, 
or we can look around the picture in our mind of this room and the people that we farm with or the people that we work with or the people that we know in our families or the people that we don't know that we know are out there and gain that energy from each other to keep on fighting. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I've been asked to leave a few minutes if there's a question or two. Um, but I really, it, it gives me energy to come here and see all of you and know that it's not just the little isolated place of Vermont where I feel so lucky to live with such a concentration of dedicated, positive people, but to come out to a place like this and say, great, there are more concentrations and these concentrations are everywhere. And so thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank you for the knowledge you're gonna impart upon me throughout the rest of today as I'm here at other workshops and then maybe if we get to chat at the panel that I'm on later with Gail. So thank you for being here and I'd love to answer any questions if there's a question or two. Please. Hi, um, Pamela. I'd just like to say that um, the 53% of American women who supposedly voted for Trump were about half of the 26% of actual American voters who voted so, for, you know, right. for him, of which you know, for less than 40% actually voted of the whole country. Right. So there's extreme uh, fatigue and boredom and apathy about voting at all or getting involved in the political system at all, yep. which is rigged by metadata, meta, meta, uh, companies hired from England to parse all the statistics of where somebody like Trump could actually win, mm -hmm. you know, in the electoral system. And, um, you know, the, the kind of rigging that's going on globally even, not just in the United States, against organic farming or ownership of land and so on, by the Eric Princes of the world and the corporations now consolidating more and more like um, Sygenta and Monsanto, et cetera. Right. Um, I think, you know, of course, all the good feelings and the goodwill and the, yes, let's all do it together is fine, but how do you beat a rigged system like that? And that's sure. really okay. driven by massive amounts of money. It is. So uh, there's no doubt that there are tremendous challenges ahead of us. Um, I would argue you beat the system from the bottom up. You build the roots, you build the soil, just like organic farming. You're gonna get a much healthier system when you start at the bottom. And, um, you know, I did not become lieutenant governor overnight. It's been 20 years. I never thought 20 years ago I was gonna be lieutenant governor of Vermont. I thought I was speaking out too much and too far on issues like GMOs, on marriage equality, on raising the minimum wage, to ever climb politically. I was just gonna work at the local level and fight and see what change I could make. And that's what's happened. And it turns out I got to go up. But, um, but we have to uh, take over at the local level, just like the Progressive Alliance here uh, and others are doing in communities around the country, because you can do it at the local level without as much money. You can still door knock and have the human connection and talk to people face to face at the local level. We are not gonna flip a switch. I mean, the fact that Bernie did as well as he did is remarkable given the money and the rigging of the system and everything else. And if he chooses to run again, he's gonna cream the field, right? First of all, he's gonna go in thinking he can win. So we'll have bases built up and, and offices or in parts he didn't think he could win, but also his name recognition is just so far beyond what it was. But you don't just start at the top. We've gotta to do it from the bottom. You've gotta think about running for a commission seat or a city council seat or a school board seat so that in our schools we teach true U.S. history from you know, a Howard Zinn perspective like I was lucky enough to have, even in a public system. Um, but as long as we're teaching American white male history that dominated the world without any reality of the effects of what that was and all the other people that were involved and all the people that got slaughtered and all the people that got uh, run over and all the roles of all the powerful women that were involved that aren't in these books. If we don't change our, our teaching of history to the truth, you know, so we can do it, but it's got to start at the bottom. We're not going to win at the top money-wise. What's that? Well, sure. So we can just give up. I mean, I, I just, so she said, you know, the rigged system by the Cokes and others. 
I, I believe we can change it. I mean, I have spoken out on some pretty major stuff and um, people have attacked me and in my campaign for lieutenant governor, in one ad, I was a, a racist thief uh, and uh, so forth. But by having worked for years with people across the state of Vermont on GMO labeling, on marriage equality, on raising the minimum wage, on sustainable agriculture, uh, people knew me. And so the ads didn't work as well. Uh, and so it's got to be done from the ground up. Yeah. Hi. Um, as you know, so many states are starting to embrace the soil carbon issue. In California, we have the Healthy Soils Initiative, and Hawaii has the new Carbon Farming Task Force. So, in Maryland, has passed a bill. Um, and in the state of Vermont, there is probably the most progressive bill of all um, that was introduced by farmer Jesse McDougall for regenerative agriculture. And I'm just wondering. Um, how likely you think it is to be passed in the next session sure. in Vermont? Sure. Um, I know Jesse, and uh, I think it's exciting to have the conversation about regenerative agriculture. I actually served on the Senate Agriculture Committee, the prior biennium, when that was brought up. And I will actually tell you that um, I was not overly supportive. Okay, and, uh, and the reason is, um, as an organic grower who's gone through the GMO labeling fight, and what GMO labeling has meant, in terms of now consumers who actually think GMO free is more important than organic, not recognizing even that organic already was GMO free and also had many other practices far more uh, beneficial to the earth than GMO free, which is conventional chemical agriculture uh, in most instances, um, that it also wasn't, wasn't ready yet. There were two or three farms that wanted certification and the cost to the state, which would have also meant a $10,000 certification fee, would have been impossible for a two or five acre regenerative farm to cover. Uh, and so really, like organic, I think we have to build the, the movement of regenerative ag to a far more mature place before we actually have government all of a sudden starting to define what regenerative ag is. Because once government defines it, there's much less opportunity for it to grow and mature as an entity. And I would argue even with organic agriculture, and I think this is the last question, I apologize, sir, I've been told, um, it was, is that, um, that uh, regenerative agriculture, organic, um, that in organic agriculture, we're about to be, uh, we're still fighting around the issue of soilless agriculture. And we've got this big meeting in October, if, California, if, if Florida still exists around Halloween, uh, around soilless organic agriculture, which is currently practiced by Driscoll's and others, and has the opposite of soil regener regeneration. Uh, it doesn't use soil at all. It's totally out of sync with what holistic organic farmers think organic agriculture is. And we're fighting just to maintain what organic agriculture is. And so I think for a lot of consumers, creating another label and another term, I just don't think we're there yet. Um, we need to build that from the grassroots first. And I would close by saying, with respect to that, and with respect to organic agriculture, and with re respect to soil sequestration, and growing crops in a, in a more comprehensively holistic way, it is often more expensive. And as we work to do agriculture in this way that is, that is regenerating our planet and cleaning our air of the over, overpopulation of carbon molecules, uh, we have to. We absolutely have to, and this is probably the number one lesson I learned from Bernie back in 1992. If we don't deal with economic injustice, we will not win environmental justice, period. Because when only 3% or 5% of the population can afford to buy food at the real cost of food production, we will never take over the food supply system. So unless we spend some time working towards the fight for 15, towards universal health care, towards affordable housing, we will lose the environmental battle. Just as, thank you, because just as GMO labeling got defeated here by their using lying propaganda ads saying it was going to cost people more because the study said if you buy organic food, it's going to cost you $400 more, they just said it's going to cost you $400 more. And you lost millions of votes from that lie because $400 was a big number to millions of people. And so until we deal with economic injustice, we will lose on environmental justice and social justice and others. So I hope people remember we're all in all of these fights together. And I know many of you already think that. Thank you again for the opportunity. I look forward to chatting with you more some later today. Really appreciate
appreciate uh, an opportunity to talk about how it's not just soil, not oil, but it's got to be healthy seas, not oil. And uh, John and uh, Miguel asked me to... Uh, my name's David Helvarg. I'm an author, executive director of Blue Frontier. We're an ocean conservation and policy group based out of uh, Washington, D.C. and Richmond, California. And um, we just want to talk. Uh, I brought together a tremendous... Yeah, we want to talk about the other 71%. <laughs> and uh, how it connects and how the connection between soil and the ocean is not just negative, is not just, you know, right now we've, we're overfished, overheated ocean, we're polluted with, with uh, oil and chemicals and uh, plastics and nutrients that are running off into our seas. But we also have great opportunities. One of the panels yesterday talking about the regenerative ocean and we've seen the resiliency of the ocean, which is tremendous. We've seen it here in Richmond. We've seen it in California. My last book, The Golden Shore, California's Love Affair with the Sea, is about how we can actually grow our solutions faster than our problems. And one of those solutions is the way we deal with our coast and ocean in California. We're 40 million people. We're the world's sixth largest economy, and we're doing good by our ocean. And um, then we have our Dopplinger states like Texas and uh, Florida which have allowed the uh, oil industry and the developers and big ag to take over. And I was in uh, Florida on election night, nine months into a uh, algal bloom that had been poisoning uh, large coastal areas of Florida. And I wrote that uh, I was there election night when they voted to drown themselves. I didn't mean it literally, but I do have a problem with people who kind of reject NOAA scientists when they tell them that the climate is rapidly changing but believe these same NOAA scientists when they say that there's a hurricane headed your way and you've got to evacuate. So we're going to talk about where the land and ocean intersect, and I'm honored that I was able to bring some of what well, I consider the leading um, people who are making those connections. Um, Karina uh, Nielsen is the director of the uh, Romberg um, Romberg Tiburon Center, which is really the marine lab for the Bay Area from San Francisco State University. Anna Cummins is a founder uh, and strategic director for Five Gyres, which has identified all the global plastics and the great five gyres of our ocean planet, and also has done advocacy to do something about it, including passing a national law that uh, helping to do things, and she can talk about that. And uh, Vicky Vasquez is with the, uh, um, what is it, the Pacific Shark Research Center. I mean, you can't think about the ocean without the sharks, and, you know, California, we have, we're very proud of our white sharks, you know, there, because if there's not something bigger and meaner than you out there, it's not really wilderness. And we have a beautiful Pacific wilderness here, and Jason Scorse is the director of the uh, Center for Blue Economy which is about the hundreds of billions of dollars of value we have by not drilling, by building a diverse ocean economy, which you'll discuss, and uh, that's at the Middlebury Institute, Middlebury Institute for International Studies in Monterey. So um, they're gonna briefly talk, we'll have some discussion, maybe some time to talk about how you see the soil and sea connection, but uh, I'd like to start with Karina and thank you. Hi everyone, thanks David, thanks for that introduction. I'm a, I'm a scientist. I'm one of those uh, people we don't believe so much anymore, I guess. Well, hopefully we do. Um, I started out life as a marine ecologist, but if you go back even further, I started out as a chef, so um, I, I have a relationship to food as well as uh, to science. Um, but. What's not always so apparent, I think, for people, even though the ocean covers 71% of the planet, is the connections between what we do on land and how that affects the ocean. I think people are pretty aware about the um, issues with overfishing. Um, what's not so apparent is, is, is how we impact the ocean in more diffuse ways. The connections between the land and sea become kind of obvious if you see something like a pipe that's got uh, runoff or sewage dumping into the ocean. We've certainly seen images like that, and that actually um, is probably a pretty vivid image, yet it's probably not among the most important ways in which we're impacting the oceans. Um, 
how we actually produce our food on the land, uh, what kind of food we produce, how much of it we produce, how we transport it, uh, how we fertilize it. Um, these things have a huge influence on our connections with the ocean through the land. Uh, the biogeochemical cycles that we're impacting result in the flow of nutrients and carbon from the land through our watersheds and through the atmosphere, the other solution that bathes the planet, um, and they eventually meet the sea in one way or another. Um, it, from, from one, you know, we think a lot of in the ocean about one major nutrient because it tends to be the most limiting, and that's nitrogen. It's also not limiting in the atmosphere. It's the most abundant gas we have in the atmosphere. And we've been doing an incredible job of pulling it out of the atmosphere, fixing it, and applying it to the landscape. And a lot of that ends up in the ocean. Um, the other big problem that we've had recently, of course, is, is climate change and the combustion of fossil fuels. And from that process, we're grabbing all the carbon that's stored in the, in the soils and in the, in, the, in the earth and combusting it and releasing it up into the atmosphere. And that, in turn, is bathing the planet, overlaying the ocean. And in fact, the ocean has absorbed about 30% or so of the fossil fuels, the, the carbon dioxide we've released in the atmosphere for carbon from burning, uh, combusting fossil fuels. So through these two huge processes by which we're impacting biogeochemical cycles that are not necessarily as vivid or as visible as a pipe dumping pollution into the water, we are having a dramatic impact on the oceans. Um, ni nitrogen and phosphorus and carbon dioxide and light, of course, are also the essential elements that make the ocean grow, if you will. It's the base of the food chain. It's the base of the food chain on the planet. It's the base, basis by which photosynthesis converts those things into plant matter. Um, and they are, they're important in, in all our ecosystems. And of course, the animals that consume these then are engaged in transforming these materials and returning them to the soil and the water and the atmosphere. So we too are part of this large cycle. But globally, we have made huge impacts on these cycles. We have dramatically increased the movement of phosphorus, one of these important nutrients, from the land into the ocean by a factor of at least three. Um, we've had an even more dramatic impact on the flow of nitrogen from the atmosphere through the landscape into the oceans, up, upwards of tenfold in some cases and in some places. And it's especially dramatic in areas of high uh, human population. And of course, as I mentioned before, about 30% of the carbon dioxide we've released from the Earth through combustion of fossil fuels has been absorbed by the oceans, which has other implications for the ocean. So as I said, those point sources of, of flowing in are probably not the biggest problem, even though they may be the most obvious. We can actually manage those reasonably well, and we have some solutions for those. Um, it's the larger watersheds, um, and especially the watersheds that host a lot of agricultural activity um, that, and atmospheric nitrogen pollution that are the hardest to manage uh, and to control. Most of the nitrogen, for example, that's being delivered into the Mississippi is coming from uh, fossil fuel combustion and animal feeding operations that end up delivering a lot of nitrogen into, the, into that watershed. Um, and that deposition can be either directly or by um, the runoff from the land. So the production, obviously, of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer has been responsible for the largest change in the global nitrogen cycle, um, converting it from the atmospheric form into a form that the crops end up uh, uh, using, obviously. We are now using and putting into um, converting and fixing about 110 teragrams of nitrogen per year. Um, over half of the inorganic nitrogen that we've ever used on Earth has been applied during about the last 30 years. Um, and if you want to know approximately how much that is, just to imagine how much that is, one teragram is about a million metric tons. And a blue whale weighs more or less 200 tons. And that would give you about half a million blue whales. We don't have anywhere near half a million blue whales in the ocean. Um, so that is an awful lot of inputs. Um, 
the watersheds carry this nitrogen to our estuaries and coastal waters and it has a major, can have a major impact. Many of you have probably heard of the um, effects of eutrophication. Um, nitrogen ends up fertilizing these waterways, the estuaries um, that are near us. They produce enormous phytoplankton blooms, often in response. And as those phytoplankton blooms decay, the microbes uh, consume them, and they put in lots of carbon dioxide and pull the oxygen down, and we get these huge dead zones. This year, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, we had one of the largest dead zones um, occurring that has happened in over 30 years. It's about the size of New Jersey. Um, and it impacts the, um, obviously it suffocates a lot of marine life and we have losses of shrimp and other fisheries that um, often um, would, would do much better in the absence of that pollution. One of the ways in which we can actually start combating some of this and in, and in fact use nature to help us solve these is to restore our estuaries, to restore some of the nitrogen capturing capacity of wetlands. And in fact, this also will help us with carbon capture. So some of the things we've been doing in the Bay Area now about uh, using um, nature-based adaptation and restoration techniques are not only gonna help us with some of the um, issues that we have with capturing nitrogen, but also with reducing the impacts of um, carbon pollution. So on that note, I think I'll end and pass it along to our next speaker. Good afternoon. Do I need to do anything here? Good afternoon, my name is Anna Cummins. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. You've all eaten lunch now, so I get to talk trash. I'm especially excited to be here. Most of the conferences I go to, I'm surrounded by ocean people. I'm sure we're all in the same boat, no pun intended. So it's nice to have my feet back on the ground. And this is a topic that I'm really excited about. Um, I've, since I first learned about compost when I was 14, this is really what sparked my interest in all things sustainability. I was so enamored of compost that my first boyfriend in high school courted me by leaving a moldy peach on my doorstep knowing that I would love watching the fuzz take it over. So I feel safe sharing that story here. Ten, for the last 10 years though, I have been deeply immersed in a much darker form of waste and that is plastic pollution. Our organization Five Gyres has sailed over 60,000 miles across the world's oceans doing scientific research. I have seen firsthand what the last 60 years of our disposable society has done to the entire planet, including some of the most remote places on Earth, our entire food chain, and even our own bodies. And if I could sum up all these experiences in a single word, it's a word that we've heard over the last few days, and that is accountability. How can we hold big plastic, which is really big oil, accountable for a planet fouled with plastic pollution? Now, the plastics industry has historically blamed we, the people, for, for littering instead of taking responsibility for the end life. They tried to reframe this as a behavior problem. Meanwhile, they are relentlessly and quietly producing millions of tons of single-use, non-recyclable, toxic plastics. And it's impossible for me to look at this photo, my hometown of Los Angeles, the beach in Santa Monica, and not see a design failure. When you look at this photo, it's mostly single-use objects, packaging made from fossil fuels, highly toxic, that we use for moments, but that are designed to last indefinitely. So how did we get here to this point today where we have literally covered 21% of our planet's surface with a smog of plastic pollution? Now, it really started here back in the 40s and the 50s when we were sold this American dream of prosperity through endless consumerism. I love this photo. This was the cover of Life magazine in 1955. The article was titled Throw Away Living. And this is when we celebrated the advent of plastics. They're cheap, they're lightweight, and sign of the times, they would save housewives from the chores of doing the dishes. We could just throw it all away. Well, of course, 60 years later, we are seeing the global impacts of this. 
And you don't need to walk far. In fact, I just walked out to the front steps of this auditorium and bam, there it is. Plastic packaging, straws, bags, bottles, you name it. And I'm going to talk about the marine impacts, but I do want to point out that there is a justice issue inherent in this as well. We in the Global North, uh, the recycling that we collect in the Global North, most of it we ship overseas to China, to Vietnam, to India, to places that don't yet have adequate waste management infrastructure and where communities are literally living on and amongst our waste. And this is how plastic gets into the ocean. We talk about the land-sea connection. Roughly 80% of the plastics we find out in the oceans starts here on land. It's as simple as this plastic straw. Every stream, watershed, river, and unfortunately storm drain is a connection between land and sea. And just as it washes pesticides, which we've been talking about a lot, into our oceans, it's also washing plastic waste. And once this plastic gets out into the oceans, it gets once this plastic gets out into the oceans, it gets swept up into these massive oceanic current systems called gyres. There are five major gyres in the world. It's a natural phenomenon, but this is where plastic made from petrochemicals is fragmenting and accumulating, but it never really goes away. Now, what impact does this have on marine wildlife? Devastating impact. Oops. Devastating impact on marine wildlife through entanglement. The bigger stuff can trap turtles and dolphins and all kinds of species, but also ingestion. There's also a human health impact here, since some of us maybe don't care about turtles, but we do care about our own bodies. And that's how plastic is getting into the food chain. Now, we know that plastic particles in the ocean act like sponges for contaminants. Things like PCBs, DDT, chemicals that are endocrine disruptors linked to all kinds of issues, stick to plastic like a sponge. And the science is now going smaller and smaller and smaller. A single grain of plastic the size of a lentil can have up to a million times higher concentration of these contaminants. But we're now finding microplastics and nanoparticles of plastic in the bodies of zooplankton, in the circulatory systems of oysters and mustards and, and, and uh, mussels, or mustards, mussels and other bivalves. We're also seeing microplastics in everyday consumer products, drinking water, honey, sea salt, God forbid, beer, and also in many of the fish that people eat today. This is a fish that my husband caught while drifting from Los Angeles to Hawaii on a boat we made from 15,000 plastic bottles and a bunch of junk called Junk Raft. And as he went to fish this fish out and eat it, he cut open the stomach and found 17 pieces of plastic inside. Which brings up the question, as these contaminant-laden plastics are entering the food chain, are we becoming plasticized? Now, we've heard some pretty devastating stories about how some of our most vulnerable communities are impacted by pesticides and agricultural fields. Um, I want to share my own personal story just to give an idea of today's baseline. In 2009, before having a child, we did a body burden study on me and found trace levels in my blood serum of PCBs, DDT, PFCs, and flame retardants. And if any one of us in this room did the same study, we would find something similar. This is an absolutely unaccountable failure, um, unacceptable failure in accountability. So I want to end on a positive note, an example of how we can use science to drive accountability. We went into the Great Lakes in 2012 to try and uh, link this to inland communities. And what we found in the Great Lakes was more plastic by count than any of the oceans we had surveyed. And the slide I skipped over was, we have found 5.25 trillion particles weighing 269,000 metric tons. But in the Great Lakes, we found more plastic by count in Lake Erie. And it turned out the source of that were microplastics, microbeads, and personal care products. So we were able to use that science to drive accountability. We banded together with a bunch of our partners, with NRDC, Story of Stuff, Surfrider Foundation, on and on, to pass a bill in California, which then provided the momentum for a federal bill to ban the sale of products that contain microbeads, and that will go into effect this year. Now, there's... <laughs> this, to me, is an example of the power of, of, of collaboration. 
of what we can do when we really band together. And my hope today is that we can create more alliances between land and sea because we all have the same goal here and that is to end our dependence on fossil fuels. Es un ejemplo de lo que podemos hacer cuando trabajamos juntos. Muchísimas gracias. My name is Vicky, and I am a graduate student at Moss Landing Marine Lads, and I am also their social media manager, and I'm also the deputy director of a group called the Ocean Research Foundation. And uh, most recently, I was also on Shark Week. So you might be wondering, why do you have a Shark Week scientist talking to you uh, at this conference? Um, well, for uh, what I was doing, in Shark Week, I was looking at new deep sea species of sharks, and that might sound like a very far away voyage, and it wasn't. It took about 10 minutes of a boat ride because the deep sea canyon off of where we were working was right next to the coastline. And this is incredibly similar uh, to where I am in Moss Landing Marine Labs. Moss Landing Marine Labs sits right at the uh, deep sea canyon of Monterey. And then right in front of that, if any of you guys are familiar with the area, is a lot of agriculture. So what I wanted to talk to you a little bit today is how agriculture has actually been connected uh, to the work at my lab as well as sharks, which may not seem like a straightforward connection. So the first thing I wanted to point out was uh, a really, really interesting group that we have at Moss Landing Marine Labs, and this is the um, Central Coast Wetlands Group. They're doing a fascinating project right now um, using uh, the whole bioreactor uh, technology concept. And so basically what that is, is an open air laboratory. And what they started with was this. Basically nothing. What you can kind of see in the background, oh great, is some of the agricultural land um, of Castro Valley. And what they wanted to do is figure out how they could help filter and clean this agricultural water because as I'm sure uh, many of you are aware, that used to be the jobs of wetlands and we are constantly uh, losing wetlands. We are losing these natural ways to clean this water. So this is what they started with. And as you can see, they had to do a lot of work. They um, had to get tractors, they had to dig, they even had to get like a, um, different wa uh, water sources. And slowly it started to turn into this. And so what you're seeing is that open air laboratory I was talking about. So what they're currently doing right now is they're having that agricultural water filter through these systems and they're trying to figure out which one of these systems works best. And so they have uh, wood chips, they have alfalfa, they have controls, and um, what they are then doing is having this uh, go through a wetland. Now I just want to quickly show you guys the, um, that other picture again, just as a reminder. There's no wetland around this, it was just dirt, and they slowly built and you can kind of see there's, there's more land around it. And the last thing I want to show you is a, a short video, an aerial that you can see how what used to look like just dirt is now not only um, a test system for the water but also a natural wetland behind it and they're slowly testing to see how the water gets cleaner and cleaner through these different systems. So let me see if I can play this. Um, it might work better to play it from, great, thank you. So as you can see, pretty short. So that's one half of what Moss Landing Marine Labs um, has been doing to, to study how to better clean this water. But the part that I work with a lot more is um, the ecosystems. And so the next thing I wanted to show you, which is right next to this area, is Elkhorn Slough. So right down here, it's just out of sight of the um, of the picture is Moss Landing Marine Labs. And one of the things that happened in this area was not only all the agricultural uh, work that has shifted and changed this land over time, but also a harbor. And so what that harbor meant 
is they needed an opening. That was created. That is man-made right there. And so, it, as you can imagine, what this did was flooded the rest of this area with a lot more water than it would have naturally had. And what some papers have um, written about this area is that this should actually be a dry valley. So sediments should have been, over time, slowly uh, filling this in so that this waterway is no longer there. Um, and so what's interesting, though, is that these are some of the animals that live in that slough. And so it's really weird to talk about an anthropogenic influence that has arguably had a positive influence for the elasmobranchs that you see behind me. Um, elasmobranchs are not only sharks, but they're also their cousins, the rays, which is why I have some pictures um, of other animals. So we see here, this is a bat ray. Over here is a brown smooth hound. To the lower end is a thornback ray. And then over here is a leopard shark. Now, when I say it's a positive story, um, what I mean by that is, hey, there's sharks there and they probably weren't gonna be there before and it looked like it was gonna dry up. But is that completely true and a completely positive story? I'm not really sure. What we do know is that this area used to be uh, much more bountiful with uh, brown smooth hound sharks and the research that one of my lab mates is currently doing is showing that there seems to be now a bigger switch to thornback rays. So what we might be seeing is that as we have different influences in these areas, we are changing the composition of the animals there. Um, there's also been some guitar fish, not as uh, frequent. And then I just wanted to end with a photo of my lab mate. That is how she was collecting her field work, not simply on the boat, but actually in the water. Um, it's a little hard to see, but that is her there with a leopard shark, um, collecting data and then releasing it. Um, so. If you guys would like to have any questions related to how these animals are using these coastal ways as they are constantly changing, uh, that is what part of my lab is looking for. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am, my name is Jason Skouris, and I'm with the Center for the Blue Economy. And I study big economic trends and big data and all that, but I, I'm not going to talk about that as much today, but talk about something a little bit more directly related to, to you all. And, and I, I consider myself a pretty hardcore foodie, so I feel like I'm in the right tribe here and um, amongst uh, kin, so it's good to be here. And I'm going to also focus on something where I think we have a lot more um, potential for uh, personal empowerment and actually making change. So what I'm going to talk about isn't really require big national legislation or big movements, although I will mention a couple uh, directions on that. And so the two biggest things or the biggest thing that is impacting the ocean right now is climate change. So that's the big threat. And it's obviously more than just the oceans that are at threat, but that's the big threat. And there are two paradigms that need to change in order for us to, to address climate change and actually have a chance at a, at a prosperous, livable future by the end of this century. We spend a lot of time focusing on, uh, slow, okay. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, I talk fast. All right, so I'll, I'll try here. Um, we've been focusing a lot on renewable energy. And that's been incredible, as, as many of you probably in this room probably have your own solar or, or even uh, drive an electric car. And I, we can talk about that. That's an incredible revolution. The other revolution, though, is going to be required is a change in the food system. So if, most people don't realize that, especially in a lay audience, that we could have 100% renewable energy, but if the diets of 50 years from now are the diets of today, we will still not solve climate change and we will still not have a livable future. And so the big paradigm shift that needs to happen is, an, is a movement away from animal-based products as the predominant diet. <laughs> I'm glad. Well, I knew I was well among friends. <laughs> uh, and I actually was really happy because I go to all these environmental conferences and I go out and the lunch is roast beef, red listed fish, plastics, you know, and, and, and uh, styrofoam. And I'm going, how can people talk about this stuff all day and then go and not live it, right? So I was really happy to see, um, to see you all walking the walk because I know I'm talking to, uh, to people who, who get it. And, and so 
I want to say here is that all the fights for organic agriculture, uh, anti-GMO stuff are incredibly important, but really this simple movement down the food chain is really, I would say, orders of magnitude more important than all the rest. And again, not to try to create a hierarchy here, but just in terms of prioritization. And I, we can get into maybe in the q and A. I, I'm writing a couple articles on this, all the other amazing health and political benefits that will come from a world in which the United States is not so unhealthy and spending hundreds of billions of dollars on preventable illness. But linking it to the oceans, this is the key thing, right? If we can move away from a diet based on animal products and dairy as the, the, the dominant source of protein, the oceans will be the biggest beneficiaries. In addition, the seafood is a, is a big issue. Just to point this out, so if I was to say, you know, that I ate a tiger or a gorilla for dinner last night, most of you would be aghast because you would think, even though ethically it's not really that much different in terms of pain or sentience than eating a pig or a cow, you know that tigers and, and gorillas are very endangered species and they're very important in our ecosystems. It turns out that eating a bluefin tuna or a swordfish is actually worse ecologically than eating a tiger or a gorilla. We just haven't, because the oceans is kind of this out of sight, out of mind, and fish are these things kind of like reptiles that are thing all of as weird and not as charismatic as a tiger or a gorilla. But ec from an ecological standpoint, from an endangered species standpoint, eating bluefin tuna for sushi is worse than eating a tiger for a steak. And so I have a friend, I don't have his slide up here, but a, a friend of mine who is in New York he just launched, he's an investor in a new product. It's going to be available in Whole Foods starting in, in October. It's called Ahimi, and it's Ocean Hugger Foods, and it is a plant-based, tomato-based tuna substitute that has been developed by master chefs, and it is being met with rave reviews. And so this is the future, right? So you all who are in the food movement, the introduction and the movement towards plant-based foods to take substitute away from the tuna and the swordfish and the meat and the dairy. I'm not saying everyone's got to become vegan overnight, but this is where the investment's going. Silicon Valley's putting the big money in it. This is where all the big food companies see it. They're so scared that they're actually trying to get the, FD, the USDA and the FDA to, to say that, you know, non-dairy milks aren't real milk and they're fighting against things because they're losing this battle. And so I just want all of you in the food movement to know that this is as important as solar panels, as wind farms, but changing the food system is something that's more trophically appropriate for 10 billion people and more ethical. So on that, um, thank you. Obviously, all of these folks could go on a lot, but we wanted to open up some time. Um, I already don't eat bluefin tuna, but after what you said, I'll stop eating tiger as well. Um, Actually, at Blue Frontier, we decided some years ago to stop serving sustainable seafood and serve gourmet vegetarian and vegan. Not basically just because I got tired of all the other ocean groups serving sustainable seafood where, you know, it's like I go to forest conferences and the forest conservationists don't open up with a big bonfire. <laughs> so I think we've got, you know, what, what we try to do mainly at Blue Frontier is, is you know, get people to school together. So all of my friends and colleagues are part of this movement. Like with your movement, we know what the solutions are. Um, as I said on the opening night, number 12 on the 50 ways to save the ocean is eat more organic and vegetarian. And then I talk about local sourcing. But beyond that, number one is go to the beach because you protect what you love. And obviously people, people love fertile soils and they love wildness and, and our oceans are still incredibly wild, although incredibly at risk. So I thought what I'd do, and, and as I say, we know what the solutions are and we need movements to, uh, to generate those solutions. We need to go to the political will. We've, we've lobbied successfully on bills against microplastics. We had a lobby and we stopped pirate fishing. We haven't stopped it, but at least we have the, the tools of enforcement. We had uh, at our last Blue Vision Summit the largest um, citizen lobby 
for the oceans up on Capitol Hill, 25 states, including the Inland Ocean Coalition from Colorado and Utah and Arizona and Michigan and Vermont, because every state's a coastal state. We, you know, we all love not only to uh, dive and body surf and commune, but uh, also to breathe. And those other plants, the phytoplankton, are letting us breathe. So since I don't have enough opportunities with my friends and colleagues, I thought I'd do one or two questions here, and then we'd open it up until Miguel kicks us off the stage. <laughs> um, first, a lot of the soil not all theme is, is that healthy soils are great carbon sequesterers. Um, and I'd like to ask you about the greatest carbon sequestering plants, and maybe uh, start with Karina and anyone else. The greatest, the greatest carbon sequestering plants? <laughs> Seaweeds, kelp, sea grasses actually are another, um, salt marshes, actually the, the marine soils, if you will, the peats that develop in salt marshes, those are great carbon sequestration uh, tools under some circumstances. Um, as a matter of fact, in California, which is pretty interesting, there was a bill passed not too long ago about promoting the um, restoration of eelgrass specifically for this purpose to help us sequester more carbon and sweeten the water so that um, it's less acidic because as I think most of you probably know, the um, uh, dissolution of carbon dioxide into the water, that absorption that I was talking about before causes ocean acidification. And a lot of our shellfish don't do so well. They don't grow well. They can't form their shells well um, when, that's, uh, when the waters are very acidified. Um, so, so carbon sequestration in the ocean is really important. Uh, there are other ways. People have talked about biogeoengineering, um, which I think is a little dangerous, but um, people have talked about taking phytoplankton, which produce, say, 50% of the oxygen in the atmosphere, but are you know, fixing carbon in that process and trying to enhance what we call the biological pump, which is to push them down into storage in the deep, deep ocean. Um, and there are some crazy uh, experiments going on with fertilizing the oceans with iron and stuff like that that are, that are really um, need a little more thoughtful approach uh, and care. Uh, some of those are happening in uh, high seas, in the high seas that are unregulated, or they're being done uh, by duping um, uh, engagement by people who don't realize the problems they may cause. So there are some pros and cons to the blue carbon markets, if you will, um, and we need to be, we need to use science to sort of figure out what the best approaches are. And, and John and Dan yesterday had a good panel on the kelp farming down in Goleta and growing out. Kelp farming is, is both a great source for cosmetics, food, uh, foamier beer heads. Um, but I just want to say we were having dinner with uh, Karina and Kathy, who's the eelgrass expert at her lab, who was complaining that this, this bill had been introduced and the science of, you know, wasn't up to speed. If, if we can actually do eelgrass restoration, they'd be counted as carbon offsets. And I just had to point out to Kathy that we're living in a state where we actually have politicians who introduce eelgrass legislation. And, and so, uh, you know, what you need is, is when the science becomes policy, you're in a good situation. I guess I was just going to say that there are so many good reasons to make, you know, restore eelgrass that it, it almost doesn't matter. It's a win-win. There's, there's no downside to doing that. So, anyway. <laughs> okay. um, does anyone have questions? Maybe you should open it up, continue the conversation, join the sea party. The ocean's rising and so are we. We're, we're, we're figuring the ocean movement has is, is reached the point where we can join women and science and climate and we're gonna have a march for the ocean next June 8th, which is World Ocean Day. And it's only gonna succeed if we link it to all the other movements that, that represent we the people. First question. Yeah, perhaps the biggest elephant in the room would be Fukushima for the oceans. And I don't know if you can talk about that. Um, I've heard how devastating it is to the sea creatures, to seafood, to ocean products such as kelp. So maybe you can address the status, uh, what's being done, and how we can help. Um, I really appreciate you bringing that up because it's a, a really great example of how um, science can get uh, miscommunicated. Um, I know that when you look especially on social media, um, there often have been these very convincing but unfortunately 
very misleading connections um, from Fukushima. And so basically what happens is um, in social media, uh, scary things happen and, and sad things happen. A really great example is the recent uh, die-off of sharks in San Francisco Bay. And um, right around this time, there's also been um, at least two deaths of, of great white sharks. And this was also li linked to Fukushima. Um, however, that was not an issue. Um, there have been scientists, especially from my lab, who have used um, the radiation from Fukushima as markers. Um, they've also used the radiation from Fukushima as markers for bluefin tuna. And they use these as markers for migration. And so what that means is that the amount of radiation in these animals was so small and negligible in terms of what you're eating, but important in terms of understanding how quickly they moved. Now, I know that doesn't sound very comforting, but there are other natural levels of radiation that I think probably other people can speak to a little bit better than, than myself um, that are also, yeah, that are, that are equal to the amount that we're seeing in California. Um, so I don't, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I would just say, of course, there are localized effects, and it's sort of similar with a lot of pollutants. There can often be really strong localized effects, but um, often they don't carry as far as people believe they may. And the, that is really the case with Fukushima. There was a lot of monitoring of kelp, actually. The seaweed growers were um, and harvesters were very concerned about that because they tend to... Um, take it up quite readily and there was a big monitoring program and there was a signal, a small signal initially and it has completely dissipated. So for all intents and purposes on the California coast at this point in time, there isn't a big worry about the radiation from Fukushima. I'd also say one more thing. Um, if you're interested in looking at more of a, a point, point, point explanation, um, I'd highly recommend uh, checking out a paper by um, Andrew Thaler. Just, just, it was a blog post um, on a, um, a blog called Southern Fried Science. And he mentions a lot of the key things that you may have heard online, and he helps uh, dispute them. And, and also, as somebody who worked as an investigative journalist for 30 years, this is also a reflection on the changing nature of our media. Most of the original images we saw like NOAA current maps that were portrayed on social media as maps of radiation emanating from Japan um, were, were put out on survivalist websites and actually a lot of environmentalists spent a lot of time refuting um, but it was clickbait because a lot of survivalists who push out um, environmental dangers that aren't the actual environmental threats um, can make a lot of money that way and this is this is how we distinguish fake news from source-based investigative journalism. Hi. I know that PG&E's uh, Moss Landing electrical plant um, generates so much pollution that they have to repaint boats in the harbor and give free um, covers for the sails and so on. And I just wonder, I'm not sure about El Segundo or San Pedro or other places up and down the coast, how much uh, acidification is coming just from these electrical plants and other you know, secondary sort of things like, that's right next to the Monterey, um, you know, National Park or whatever, Marine Park. And how much is that changing the water there? Well, uh, you know, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does equilibrate pretty quickly with the uh, ocean waters. And there are certainly localized impacts, but that's actually something we don't know a ton about. And I was just talking with a colleague the other day about the impacts of sort of dirty air as you leave the coastline and go out into the ocean. There's a, certainly a, an impact, it's sort of an area of ongoing study. So presumably there is some localized effect, but the, really the massive effect is coming from uh, the, the global um, uh, burning of fossil fuels, more so than the local. I'd say and also, just in terms of our sanctuaries, I, I mean, one thing we know for sure is we have to stop burning fossil fuels. Um, best available science says we need to leave 70% of the known reserves of oil under the seabed. And so, right now, we just got 850,000 public comments against the Trump administration's attempt to actually shrink California's four marine sanctuaries, including Monterey. Um, negate their expansions, and they've been very upfront about it. They want to open up all our offshore waters for new offshore oil drilling. Um, I was just going to say quickly with the ocean acidification, uh, we actually had a paper recently come out about juvenile rockfish 
um, with uh, Dr. Scott Hamilton at, at Moss Landing Marine Labs. And so we do have people studying ocean acidification, but they're looking at the bigger scale because to my knowledge, uh, what might be specifically happening in Moss, Moss Landing um, is, is not um, the primary focus of, of interest or where we're seeing the biggest and most serious impacts. Um, and then we also have uh, agricultural with us, uh, seaweed going on. And so we are looking, uh, well, not me, <laughs> I'm a shark person. But the uh, seaweed person, Dr. Mike Graham at our lab is also looking at ways to uh, use seaweed uh, locally, naturally as, as a new, new food source. And um, in terms of, again, talking about things like Fukushima or other things that might be contaminating it, um, obviously, if this was a serious concern, that would not be a new entre entrepreneurial um, pursuit for him. Yeah, and it's just, yeah, this is the future in terms of good protein, um, sea veggies, and uh, shellfish. And, and at this point, we talked some of the panels yesterday, Places like Hog Island uh, Oysters and Taylor Shellfish Company in the Pacific Northwest um, are not only producing uh, healthy seafood, but they're also those shellfish industries becoming the indicator species for ocean acidification because we're also seeing already the spats, the baby oyster shells being deformed by OA. Um, okay, my question is probably mostly for Karina. I'm going to start with, out with something positive so that we don't all get so depressed we can't do anything. I've been working for years to get our local sanitary district to um, uh, give recycled water to uh, urban farmers, and give, use their buffer land for an urban farm, which, they're, which they've given us 15 acres for a dollar a year and all the recycled water we can use. So that's the positive thing. Take that hose and turn it around back onto the land and you know, grow things in the cities. Um, but now I'm going to ask you the negative part, which is there's still a trillion gallons of recycled tertiary grade water going into the Bay Area waterways every year. And just to give everybody an idea how much that is, the shortfall in the Central Valley was 2.1 trillion. We threw half of that away. Um, so uh, what impact is that having? Uh, what work is being done to use that water? Talk about recycled water a little bit, please. Yeah, um, I'll have to say that's not my um, primary area of expertise, so I'm, I might uh, not have the answers that you're looking for, but I did want to echo the fact that there actually, we actually do know what to do about a lot of the problems that are, that are occurring. You gave one example just in the preamble to your question. Um, we talked about restoring wetlands. We talked about um, restoring eelgrass. We've talked about some of these um, um, cultivating seaweeds. And in fact, I believe that the aquaculture of seaweed that Mike Graham is involved in actually takes the carbon dioxide from that power plant and pumps it into the water so that it's taking it up. So there are a lot of opportunities like this. And I am sure there are, there are many more with the recycling of the water. And I'm, I'm just sorry that it, it's not my, it, it's just not something I know enough about to speak to. Just, just you know, it's high in nitrogen and phosphorus. Oh, so yeah, it's, no, I know so that. It's, it's great for agriculture. Yeah. Just yeah. that the agriculture more. is out in the Central Valley and the recycled water is in the urban center. So we need more urban farming, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> So that's for sure. We need more urban farming. Thank, thank you. Okay. So the positive thing that I can start with is that knowledge is positive power so that we can make the best, most life-enhancing choices. And I'm so grateful that you mentioned the nanoparticle contamination, the plastic nanoparticle contamination, especially of sea salt, because most people are totally unaware of that. And there are so many products, food products on the shelves now, which would be excellent otherwise, but everybody is using sea salt. So th thank you for that information, for stating that information. And of course, letting go of fossil fuels is a given. Perhaps though, also letting go to a degree of our wanting quote unquote energy at all because well I've, I've recently learned about the massive areas that China and Europe and probably people from our country are 
covering the ocean with solar panels. And I'm wondering if you know about that already. And everything is connected. So that means that these massive areas, which will increase if we, you know, if, if it's still a good business opportunity, what impact they're having in terms of light, in terms of heat, you know, cha changing the quality of life underneath them. Thank you. So to the first point, I know it was more of a statement, but I just did want to point out that we have since in the last few years discovered that the largest single contributor of microplastics to our oceans and to our waters is through the washing of synthetic clothing. Um, that, that's a tough one to wrap your head around because there's not easy solutions quite yet, um, but there's a lot of R&D happening on that now. And again, the solution to so much of this stuff is local communities, you know, urban gardening, growing your own and avoiding excess packaging but we have a long ways to go on that. To the second point. Yeah, yeah I would just say, in terms of the, the area that's needed for renewable energy for solar and wind, uh, they, they're not so great that they would have devastating ecological impacts. And again, everything's relative. I, one thing I want to just be clear, and I know you all know this, but it's just there is no zero impact living, okay, right? Life begets life, energy displaces energy. It's the quantity and, the, and how you do it. And, and so uh, a solar can have a pretty low footprint for 10 billion people relative, and it's way better than, than climate change. Uh, my question is about California agriculture and the wine industry in particular. We haven't, we, you know, people always talk about the Mississippi River and the nitrogen problems there, but there's been actually not a lot of reporting lately about California and um, the agricultural impact on the oceans. You know, we know we have a water, uh, water uh, shortages, but we don't talk much about the impact of the industries that grow all this, all these crops. I'm particularly focused on the wine industry, so um, I cover, I write about organic and biodynamically grown wines, um, and um, there's been very little awareness or reporting about anything anti-wine industry. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk about the impacts of the wine industry on the oceans. I can't, I can't speak specifically to the wine industry. I can speak about water and agriculture. And as an economist, the key thing within California agriculture is the water subsidies, right? I mean, and so it, it's a very complicated system, but I was actually part of a couple big lawsuits that were, you know, trying to get water back for rivers because they've been, a lot of these Central Valley farmers in particular have been violating um, uh, the, the Invader Species Act and Clean Water Act for, for four decades. But, but that's really the key. The key is, is the subsidies and, and paying the true cost of the water. The irony is the one big thing environmentalists are really worried about now is actually going to be the marijuana industry. Um, and that's, they're actually huge areas of nor the North Coast where they're literally just taking every drop of water out of streams to grow weed. And as much as I love weed, um, I, they shouldn't do it like that. <laughs> so there's going to be big things there. So it's, it went from grapes to now marijuana is going to be the big culprit. That's what we're going to focus on. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys very much for this uh, great panel. Um, last Bioneers, there was this guy talking about um, harvesting seaweed and clams and mussels. Um, so sort of aquaculture, but on a mass level in our seas, zero inputs. And it seems that um, if we were able to uh, get the California coastal um, commission to okay this and start um, having our food come in a large part in mass uh, from our oceans, but not necessarily from a fish form, but from seaweed, kelp, etc. Uh, we could take care of the meat problem. We could get thousands and thousands of families involved as protectors of our oceans for when they try to open up our oceans to drilling again. And so the mass uh, would already be there as you know ocean protectors um, while also cutting down on um, the uh, fossil fuel problems and CO2 problems. Yeah, from there was an amazing panel about that yesterday. You need to find the gentleman. And um, also John from, from Nutiva was involved in that. And, and that would have been Bren Smith, who's East Coast equivalent, who spoke at Bioneers. Um, the reality is, is yes, it's California. It's very difficult. We had bad, have had very bad experiences with offshore oil, which is why there's, 
instead of a NIMBY, I'd say a no-bo, a not-on-my-bay-or-ocean attitude towards R&D offshore. Um, but on the other hand, it's, um, and, and my friend, the late Peter Douglas, who uh, ran the Coastal Commission, said, you know, the coast is never saved, it's always being saved. So there's always, and I think it's a positive, there's always a huge amount of caution along the coast because every Californian has a sense of entitlement. The, the, they understand that the coast and the ocean belongs to all of us. But there is huge potential in beginning to do the R&D in looking at um, shellfish and, and uh, different forms of algae and sea vegetables. I, I mean, what's happened historically is we've fished down the trophic levels. You know, big fin fish and tuna used to be the big dollar catches in California 80, 70, 60 years ago. Now it's sea urchins and, uh, but, but it wasn't an intentional, it wasn't we're, we're going down the trophic level because we know that's where it's healthier to eat. So now it's sort of the mind change of moving in that right direction. I would just add a couple of comments. You know, the balance between, uh, we haven't been very good about looking at um, sustainable aquaculture, if you will, or mariculture, and the permitting around that is very challenging. But the principle of eating lower on the food chain and eating seaweeds and eating shellfish ha will have a massive carbon uh, impact in the positive direction. Yeah, so. And also because California has this history, the, we have our largest commercial fishing group, the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, also very attuned to the idea of more sustainable, more local, um, with the return of sardine to a small degree in Monterey Bay, um, late Zeke Grader and his, uh, his follower now talked about, you don't wanna smash up these, uh, these forage fish and turn them into fish meal for chickens and farmed fish. You wanna work with Alice Water, work with the people, the foodies, and develop Mediterranean, we're Mediterranean climate. You know, eat eat the sardines and and with lots of uh, you know lots of plant-based uh, you know calories and it's delicious and it's even you know I'm 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 not at that level yet I'm still you know I'll eat any fish that still has a fighting chance which unfortunately is fewer and r fewer between but I'll I'll catch a salmon in California because it's a you know it's got this heroic Homeric journey it's it's a heroic fish and also a delicious fish, and it's also a symbol of our commitment to keeping our waters clean. If you don't have clean waters and rivers, and if groups like commercial fish don't connect, commercial fishing groups like PCFFA don't connect with the scientists and the environmentalists and the ranchers and everyone working together, when we do work together, we get good results. And. Uh, yeah, although there is, there is one worry, um, and that is the sort of the state of the, uh, you know, We've had a hard time growing natural kelp on the North Coast for the past two years. Um, but for many of you may know that already, if you're abalone divers, um, it's, it's been slim pickings. And a colleague of mine who does North Coast uh, abalone surveys uh, for fish and wildlife, I was just talking with her the other day, and she says it's like abalone graveyards out there because there hasn't been enough kelp. So it's just kind of, it's kind of some challenges we face. And a lot of the kelp have gone away because of hot water and a lot of, we can do all the right things in California, but it's other people's choices in energy and pollution still impact us. We have to grow our movement. We can't be lo just local. And, it's, and I guess one more. One more, question. Yes. Yeah. One more question. Can you speak to um, the dangers of pen farm fishing? Recently in Bellingham, Washington, oh, yeah. we had a collapse of a farm and many deformed Atlantic the, salmon The Atlantic released. salmon, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the movement of, of non-native species around to different areas is challenging. Um, I, it, that's very unfortunate. It'll be, I guess, interesting to see what happens as a result of that. Um, but fish farming is one of those things that, that has some challenges and some benefits, depending on how it's done, right? Um, Double-edged sword sometimes. The most important thing, though, probably, is that we, you know, we can develop solutions. We can be thoughtful about how we do them, but we need to... Um, push our, ourselves and our politicians to, to make good choices for us. Um, we need to do the right thing by the oceans and by the environment, and I think this group is probably the best one to start working on those things together. Absolutely, I think the ocean community is growing. We're the next wave of resistance. We wanna link up with uh, the people who are doing right by the land. I, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm gonna, 
I have one more. Oh, we're allowed one more? Great. Yeah, one ma'am. more question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I had a question for you, and I'm sorry I don't remember your name. Um, yeah, hi. Jason. So you mentioned something about uh, synthetic tuna using heme. Is that what I heard you say? No, 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 no. Not synthetic. Um, it's called a heme. It's the name. It's ocean hugger foods. It's made out of um, algae and tomatoes. And it's uh, it's not a uh, genetically modified. Um, okay, so thing it's at all. a hemi. A hemi. A H I M I. Ocean Hugger Foods. It will be available in Whole Foods next month. A hemi. Okay. Thank you very much. I know we're out of time, but I wanted to just reiterate something that David said. June 8th next year is World Oceans Day. We need to get beyond the usual suspects of just the ocean groups. We really need a land-sea alliance. So we'd love for everyone to mark your calendars, look for more information. We can work with the Soil Not Oil Coalition to really gather everyone, because as we know, it's one planet, one ocean, and we are linked together. June 8th, March for the Ocean. Here, here. And just want to thank uh, once more uh, Vicky and uh, Karina and Anna and Jason, me. and uh, I, I'll be at the book letter. table signing books, and they'll be available to speak with you all. It's, it's just one comment, and I had heard recently that the little fish in San Francisco Bay have 10 times more PCBs than the big fish, and we were supposed to be eating low on the food chain. So I just wanted to tell you, I'm not asking you to comment, it's too late. But you start thinking about what's around the bay. And just in Berkeley, we've got UC, Bayer, and we've got these telecommunications and all the tech, and that's where the PCBs are coming from. And so, uh, cheerio. Do you find the squads that you're going to take home? Please help us because we, go, we don't know what we're going to do with all this squash. What's someone's idea to go to the Airlom Expo to bring all the squash here? So the next plenary, I think a lot of people is expecting the next speakers. They are amazing. They, they, and I'm going to invite my friend, he's one of my mentors. Kevin Danaher from the founder of Global Exchange to introduce the next the next speaker. So dig this. We are in the early stages of the first ever global revolution. Every revolution up until now was a national revolution where the revolutionary sought to gain control of the capital city to run that country differently. This is a global values revolution that is saying, instead of having money values rule over the life cycle, let's have life values rule over the money cycle. Instead of subordinating people and nature to the economy, let's subordinate the economy to people and nature. In this revolution, we are really fortunate to have amazing leaders like the next speaker, Starhawk, She's awesome. Whether you've met her or read her books, she's a goddess, a leader, a priestess, an organizer, an ass kicker. I've seen her at WTO protests. And I won't make any reference to how much more courage she has than most men. But dig, guys, we have to fix this. We, we are supposed to protect and serve, you know, not dominate. Patriarchy is a really serious problem on this planet. Male property rights in women is still a really serious issue on this planet. So we need leaders like Starhawk to, to point the way for us. And she's just amazing. I'm not going to go into a long introduction. Please join me in welcoming to the microphone, Starhawk. Thank you. Uh, it's really great to be here. And um, I'm only sorry I wasn't able to be at more of the conference, but I've had 
canceled flights and other sorts of things, and it's kind of amazing I'm here at all. So I'm grateful for that. <laughs> I just wanted to say a few things about how I see the relationship of climate change to social justice. And just to note, you know, watching the news over the last week, um, we've got a lineup of hurricanes in the Gulf, each of which seems bigger than the last one, which itself was the biggest one since whatever. We've had heat waves in the Bay Area that are completely unprecedented. We've got forest fires raging up and down the West Coast. I mean, how many people here either have had to evacuate or know someone who's had to evacuate their home? Uh, I know probably at least five different people around the country from fire or from the hurricane or from flooding um, have are at risk of losing their homes. Climate change is upon us. It's no longer theoretical. And because of that, I think this is a really crucial moment to be having this conference and a really crucial moment to be organizing around climate change. So I want to say a few things about how I see we can organize and then talk a bit about some of the things I have been doing. Um, I think when we talk about climate change, uh, we need to always be clear that climate change is a social justice issue. It's not about polar bears. I mean, it is about polar bears, but it's not just about bears. Uh, it is about people and about the gross inequalities in our system of economy and our uh, system of racism and the other divisions that uh, plague our society. Uh, you know, the states in the United States that are most at risk of hurricanes are the states with the largest black populations. Uh, the people around the globe who are most impacted by climate change and most at risk are people in the third world, people of color globally. Um, climate change is also an issue of indigenous rights and sovereignty because the things that we are doing that exacerbate climate change are, so many of them are being done on indigenous lands. So I think we need to always be clear that this is an issue of social justice and it can't be solved just by, you know, it's not going to be solved just by ma massive investment in some new technological thing Silicon Valley comes up with to make rich people even richer. Uh, it's going to be solved by changing our systems in deep, deep ways that also have to address the inequalities that we're facing. Yeah. Along with the crisis of climate change, we have this tremendous crisis of the concentration of wealth and power in fewer and fewer hands and the extreme violence that they're willing to go to in order to maintain that wealth and power. And that is the same crisis because those are the same forces that are preventing us from doing what we need to do around climate change. I also think we need to look at climate change and think about framing it as something even a little bit broader. I like to think of it as massive ecological destruction on a global scale. Because if we look at it that way, then we can get out of these like really fruitless and pointless arguments about is climate change real, is climate, you know, is the hurricane fake news, it's like, you know, nobody with their eyes open can deny that we are doing massive ecosystem destruction on a global scale. And the counter to that has to be massive ecosystem regeneration on a global scale. And that includes social, political, economic regeneration. And the good news, you know, the happy part of that is that we actually know how to do that. 
And I think you've heard this weekend many, many, many ways of approaching that. And the key is soil, not oil. Rebuilding, regenerating our soil, um, repairing our water cycles, uh, doing all of the regenerative things that people have been talking about this weekend and so many more. If we actually made a global commitment to shift and to do these things, I don't know if we at this point can reverse climate change, but we sure as hell could mitigate it. And we, uh, you know, the earth has tremendous resilience and regenerative capacities. And I actually believe that if we make the shift and say, hey, you know, our top priority right now is going to be not just repairing the damage, but rebuilding and recreating systems that can actually regenerate and heal, then I believe the earth works with us. And we have some tremendous allies, uh, allies in things that are lowly and humble, like earthworms and bacteria and algae in the ocean and fungi, all these things uh, are actually amazingly powerful earth healers uh, that can work with us uh, to regenerate and restabilize the earth's climates and ecosystems in a new way. So isn't that an exciting project? <laughs> yeah. I think we spend far too much time telling people how bad things are. Um, it's as if, you know, we're constantly telling people the story of that you could boil it down to things are worse than you thought. And it's your fault. That's not really a great mobilizing, you know, inspiring message. And in some ways, it's no wonder people turn off and go into denial and apathy or into believing all kinds of strangely unbelievable things that people are happy to believe these days. Um, I think we need to be telling people, this is the great, exciting moment of our time. This is the moment we all came in here for. Uh, into this lifetime. And this is the moment where we have the great opportunity to make an enormous transformation. And what an exciting project to be involved in. To do that, I think we need also, deep underneath it all, a shift in consciousness, a shift away from seeing the Earth as separate, isolated objects, uh, as a giant mechanism that's all set in order by some divine hand and then kind of functions on its own. Uh, we need to go back to that indigenous understanding that the Earth is a web of relationships. And I think that worldview is something, again, indigenous people have always held that. and. Um, you know, I don't want to lump all indigenous traditions together because there are thousands and thousands of them around the world who that are all different and very diverse. But I think there is a common thread in understanding that goes to the core of human life on this planet up until the last few hundred years or so that really understood that everything is in relationship. And that is true at the roots of European culture as well as many of the other cultures that we think of today as indigenous. Uh, in European culture, that worldview got severed very strongly um, because it was associated constantly throughout the medieval times and the beginnings of modern capitalism uh, with peasant rebellions and with uprisings and with resistance to this order by which some people controlled others. Uh, in particular, it was the witch persecutions in Europe uh, that created a legacy of fear 
around any of these ideas of the universe being alive and animate and dynamic, and I think we still suffer from their results today. So um, I think that that work of reconnecting, of developing an understanding of this web of relations is something that we can all do and that is core to addressing the issues of climate change. Um, yeah. So I'll just say a little about my own work. I started off as a witch. <laughs> And still am. <laughs> uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we're going to be doing our big witchy Halloween ritual on October 28th right here in this space this year, and right in the convention center. If you want a chance to experience a bit of those ancient indigenous uh, European, Middle Eastern sort of eclectic roots. Uh, and the reason that I came to that understanding, originally it was kind of realizing that in the religion I was born in, in Judaism and the other patriarchal religions, I didn't see a lot uh, that honored me as a woman. And as I got deeper into it, I also began to feel like what was important in those old pre-Christian traditions that go back before Christianity, which is really what even modern day witchcraft draws its roots from, it was again this understanding that nature is sacred and that we live in relationship with everything in the natural world. Uh, I have always been an activist in many different ways, um, but around 20 years ago I also started studying and teaching permaculture because I saw it as the practical aspect of believing the earth is sacred. Permaculture is the kind of how-to part, of putting that into practice. And so some of my work around climate change has been organizing in the permaculture community, um, trying to find ways, because I think in the permaculture community and in places like this, we have solutions. We have this understanding that if we shift to this kind of holistic worldview and start working together with nature, again, we have the tools to restore and regenerate ecosystems. And when we put them into practice, they often can uh, make those changes much more quickly than we even imagine that they might, and much more extensively. So how do we get those solutions talked about um, because if we don't, then the solutions that are going to be put into practice are a waste of billions of dollars and things on things like machines to suck carbon out of the atmosphere and then do something with it. <laughs> I actually heard uh, uh, some guy from Silicon Valley talking about this great, you know, we've got a machine now, can suck carbon out of the atmosphere. I'm like, yeah, we've had one for 500 million years or so. It's called plants. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and I also uh, teach a program called Earth Activist Training that puts together permaculture with spirituality and activism and uh, teaches a permaculture design course um, with its roots and spirit and its focus on how do we actually organize around this. As part of that, we've also been offering diversity scholarships for people of color for about the last four or five years, which I think has made a difference in really opening up uh, opportunities for a lot of really amazing, credible people here in the Bay Area and around the country. So um, I also travel and teach a lot. And I'll just say that uh, in the last month or so, I've just come back from teaching in Europe. Uh, I was in an area in Germany, in southern Germany, called the Algoi, 
uh, which is a very beautiful area on the foothills of the Alps. And one of the wonderful things there is like every farmhouse has solar panels on it. You know, Germany has really gone in for solar, rooftop solar, and the difference is amazing. You know, where you see these beautiful old houses that look like Swiss chalets, and they all have solar panels on them. And we could be doing that um, because not very many people go take vacations in sunny Germany. <laughs> it's not where you think of for like, you know, getting your tan. <laughs> Germany tends to be gray and cloudy, and yet they're producing anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of their energy with solar panels um, and renewables. Uh, Denmark, I think, is close to 100 percent. And there are many countries that are already on track to that 100% mark. So we could be doing that too, and we need to um, organize and to make that happen. Uh, I also was in an area, a wonderful area in France, called Lazade, or uh, Notre Dame des Langues. It's near Nantes, in, close to Brittany. And it's an area where they've been trying to build an airport for about nine years against tremendous resistance uh, where the activists have actually gotten together with the local people, the traditional farmers whose families have been there forever. And this 10,000 acres of land is kind of like a true autonomous zone. Uh, you go in there, the police don't go in there very much, and there are farms that were abandoned because they were going to be, you know, destroyed for the airport that people have now taken over and begun farming again. And there are collectives that have started up doing permaculture. And there are people who have gone in as an act of resistance and done things like building a beautiful traditional timber frame barn. And they have gatherings and um, wonderful actions and uh, encampments and teaching and learning. Uh, and it was an amazing experience to just be there uh, in an area. It was kind of like a glimpse of what the world might be if uh, we really shifted to a different way of being um, where everything is produced and given away for free. Uh, where people can come and live and uh, squat the land or work the land if they want to, uh, and where there is this just tremendous spirit of both resisting um, because of climate change, you know, this destruction of the land, but also doing it in a way that kind of brings alive a kind of vision of what the world could be. So. I'm going to stop, but just to say, I think that we can do that. When we organize around climate change, again, we need to be organizing around climate change as a social justice issue. And we need to do it in a way that embodies that understanding of relationship and of our deep and spiritual and healing connection to the natural world and brings that alive and allows people to see that and feel that and experience that. And then I think we can organize by inviting people into the great, exciting project of our times. Uh, and if we do that, I think we have enormous hope for making a tremendous transformation. Thank you. She just came from Europe, so I think it's, what time is now for you? <laughs> I don't know if it's four in the morning. So this is a speech at four in the morning for her, so it's great. <laughs> Our next speaker is, I, you know, I met her years ago in Seattle, and I was inviting her to be the keynote speaker of a conference that we organized before called Justice Begins With Seeds, because her organization for many years was involved in those, all these campaigns on leveling of GMOs, you know, to ban GMOs. She has been working over 20 years in issues related to water, environment, 
food, and she's also an author. Thanks to her book, Foodopoly, I understood perfectly how the corporations have, have consolidated. All this, the Grocery Manufacturer Association is controlling the whole industrial food system that, that 600,000 items that are sold in 600 different brands of, of, of commercialized food in, in grocery stores in the U.S. belong to six big companies. I learned a lot with this book, so I, I really, for many years I tried to bring her to this conference, but she lives in Washington, D.C. It's really hard because we don't have, uh, uh, sometimes we don't have the resources, you know, and sometimes she's very busy because she, she is the executive director of Food and Water Watch, that is a very big organization, and I, I am very glad that she's in, in town in these days, and it was just by chance that I was talking with my friend Adam Sko. I haven't worked in, with him for a long time, and he told me, you know, Winona Hester is going to be here, and maybe she will be able to attend the conference. And we have her today, and I am very honored to introduce her to you. So I'm really glad to be here today. I'm feeling kind of serious, though. I have family members in Florida and feeling really emotional about all of the storms, the fire and fury that we are experiencing uh, all around the world from climate change. So I agree with everything that Starhawk had to say. But I'm going to talk about the political side of the equation and why we need to be politically involved because this is a political problem. The decisions that have been made that have led to climate change, that have led to a dysfunctional food system are a result of a political system that is out of control. And of course, we really see that with the Trump administration today, although many of us know that this has been a long road and that many of these problems began decades ago and that both political parties have shared an ideology that is centered on helping the corporations who fund their campaigns and allow them to have the lifestyle that they do. So about 12 years ago, uh, some of my colleagues and I decided to start Food and Water Watch. And we really thought we were going to focus on food and water issues because these are the issues that hit us in the gut that we must pay attention to to continue to live. But alas, uh, about 2008, uh, 2009, we started getting phone calls from our members and supporters saying, you'd better look at fracking. And we did indeed start looking at fracking. And I actually have spent a big chunk of my um, work life working on energy issues. And when we started looking at what fracking is all about and the destruction of the water resources, the relation to climate change, the earthquakes. And now here in California, they're using fracking wastewater and oil wastewater to irrigate crops, even organic crops down in Kern County. We really began to see the connection between oil, food, and water resources, and why we need to make the changes to get off of fossil fuels and to protect our most important resources. And I think it was a real wake-up call to me when I saw that even the evil insurance industry, Lloyd's of London, has written a report called Food Shock that gives a almost 20% chance over the next 40 years that there will be severe storms, the kind of storms that we've been seeing around the globe, including uh, here in the Gulf, that would destroy food crops and would result in a global famine, collapse of the global economic system. 
And I know that all of you know where we need to go. Starhawk really laid out where we need to go. But unfortunately, our political leaders are incentivizing the wrong kind of um, technologies. And it's going to do more than us just working at the local level, I believe. Although working at the local level, doing all of these things is critical, but we have to work on many levels to really make the changes that we need to make. And we know who suffers the most from climate change, from a dysfunctional food system, as Skyhawk said. It is those communities of color, it is low wealth communities, it's immigrants, it's the people that have suffered from our economic system. So we at Food and Water Watch have been trying to think about how we can galvanize and give more people around the country an opportunity to really get involved in getting off fossil fuels. And it's been our feeling, and a lot of the grassroots activists around the country, that we need to stop talking about this being in the future, and we need to talk about getting off of fossil fuels within the next 10 years, certainly all the way off by 2035. And that's just to make sure that we avert the worst of climate change. So we initiated a program that I'd like to invite you or anybody that you know who wants to get involved in the political aspect of this work uh, to look at the website Off Fossil Fuels. We decided to make use of some of those technologies that the Sanders campaign did such a great job with. So the, the ability to text large numbers of people, which is how they got out those huge crowds during the election, and to create a national team that could support local efforts to get off of fossil fuels, and to give people everywhere the opportunity to be part of a team, even if they live in a place like Oklahoma or Louisiana, where they're not going to be able to uh, make their local official do what they should do at this point in time. And so we launched this a few uh, months ago. We now have a national team that does things like, for instance, there's a very dirty energy bill that would facilitate more natural gas development. Our national team has been uh, calling voter lists uh, that we supply and um, encouraging, trying to uh, help galvanize people in the target areas to get on the phone and to tell their legislator that they're watching this support for this dirty energy bill. And unfortunately, lots of Democratic senators have supported it, although we've been able to stop it at this point. And this off fossil fuels campaign, we're really trying to lay siege to the fossil fuel industry get off of fossil fuels, stop all of the new projects that are being planned around the country, the pipelines, uh, these projects that are so immoral, that are devastating uh, real people's lives, like we saw in North Dakota uh, with the Dakota Access Line. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for doing this kind of work, and it really makes a big difference. And with the off fossil fuel campaign, people are uh, getting their local elected officials to sign a pledge to only support policies that result in us getting off of fossil fuels. It can be a local city board, city uh, council person, a county board member, member of Congress, uh, and we want to do this throughout the country. And it's to start the real conversation that we need to be having about climate change. So that while we all know what's going on, we know the connections, there are many, many people who are not informed and who are being propagandized by the right-wing 
uh, press that dominates this country, things like Fox News, Sinclair Broadcasting, and it's going to be up to us. We can't just work in friendly places in the coastal areas. We need to be working across the country to change these policies. So we have about 130 public officials that have now signed the pledge, and we're really happy that the, we now have support in the House of Representatives um, a real renewables bill that really lays out the kind of program that we should be fighting for that's not in the future, but that's today. And we're real excited that Tulsi Gabbard, the uh, representative from Hawaii, introduced this bill. We have a number of sponsors, including some of your members of Congress here in California, Ted Liu, uh, Barbara Lee, Nanette uh, Barbados, a, a number of people who um, are really interested in getting this, the, the discussion going about what we need to do, what kind of program we really need to get off of fossil fuels. And um, it's our belief that we have to get away from this idea that um, somehow carbon taxes, cap and trade programs, these things that the financial services industry has really been um, a part of developing and that benefit from this the most, we need to just say no to fossil fuels. No to fossil fuels. And we need to, as environmentalists, as humanists, as people who work in our communities, we need to not be afraid of doing this. And we really need to change the discussion in the environmental community where there's so much fear about saying what we really need to do. So H.R. 36, you know, we're not dumb, we're not naive. We know we're not gonna pass this legislation this year, next year, the following year. But we need to get this out there, and the only way we can get this discussion out there and really build the political power, the support to do what we need to do is to have something that lays out what needs to be done. So this bill only uh, uses or allows real renewable energy, not things that are fake, like the fake renewable natural gas that's being promoted in California. I mean, this is an oxymoron. There is an effort to promote renewable natural gas, which is produced from digesters on dairy factory farms and then sold as renewable. Yeah, it's renewable, it's a waste product, and it's gonna uh, dig us deeper into the hole that we're already in. So this bill uh, talks about the kind of renewable energy that we should be really relying on the solar, wind, geothermal, uh, a little bit of hydro. It, um, this, the legislation was drafted with input from the environmental justice community. Very important, because as Starhawk said, we must talk about climate change as being an environmental justice issue. And those communities that are suffering the most need input into the solutions and need to help lead uh, the, the um, future and the way that we deal with these problems. So there is a just transition for worker communities who are impacted by losing their jobs and uh, funding for communities that are uh, low wealth or who uh, are suffering and could not put solar on their roofs or benefit, uh, and who need funding for weatherization, and they need renewable energy jobs. And that money comes from getting rid, ending the, the corporate tax breaks on offshore earnings. It's almost $600 billion. It ends the subsidies to the oil and gas industry. It requires that by 20, 
2025, all automobiles are zero emission. And it goes on and on. Anyway, this gives you kind of a taste of the debate that we're trying to start. And we would love to work with anybody who's interested in participating in this political work. It's going to take all of us together collectively. I believe that we can do this. This isn't about uh, that we're losing, that everything is terrible. So many people have raised their hands since the Trump uh, administration has come into office. It has been a wake-up call. And there is room for every kind of strategy and tactic. And we can work together to achieve these things. And I know that we can protect our future generations by doing this. So I remain really hopeful and I really look forward to working with all of you in the future. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have any questions, please make them short. Only five questions. I'm sorry, the first five people who line up are going to be able to make questions because we have to start the breakout. So please make very short questions, very clear, very concise, and so you can allow other people to have questions. To us. <laughs> Hi, my name is Magic. I want to thank both of you for all the work that you're doing and that you're framing this as a time of opportunity for us to bring a vision forward. I'd like to briefly plant a seed. Uh, the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco is owned by the people, and I have a vision of it becoming an art and regeneration center. And we could do this. We could make it a place for education, for our children, for parolees to be trained for new jobs, for uh, you know all people being trained, all all of the people, all of the organizations here could put on demonstrations, just like the Exploratorium used to be, only for regeneration and art. And San Francisco needs this revival. We have stopped it as activists from becoming a police museum or a private hotel in the last five years, and we are continuing to fight for a vision of art and regeneration. I would love to work with you. I'm just planting the seed for everyone here. I think it would be a dynamic place. We rose from the ashes like a phoenix during, after the earthquake with the Palace of Fine Arts and the whole fair. And my new grandson is named Phoenix, so I'm invoking the Phoenix. Thank you. Greetings to you both. I'm very excited with Winona about your idea of beginning to hold corporations responsible for the taxes that they shall now pay for the regeneration of the planet. And you can count me in on that one. Just a very brief history. After the Second World War, corporations paid 97% of taxes. 1976, they paid about 30%. About five years ago, they paid about three, and now it's almost nothing. So if we're going to continue to have a relationship with these corporations, and if we can turn them, you know, if we can be the trim tab that turns these ships, uh, you know, they can join us and they can pay for it. Hi, I had a solution of um, camping parties for, uh, to reduce vehicle miles traveled, the commuter camp out at private individuals' homes who will host them in exchange for bringing something from a store across the town when they come to visit. And I thought it was they won't have to commute to work and back every day. But right after I made that proposal, I kind of said, told a lot of people, the city of Fresno turned around and not, did not, does not allow camping in tents anymore, even on private property. So the homeless people, there's, there's 2,000 homeless people and not enough housing for them all. So now they have to live at less than third world standards, no tent laying out there, a woman laying on the street in, in the winter gets rained on, it freezes, gets ammonia and the cockroaches roll over and curl and come out of the sleeves when she goes to church and falls in the, all over the place at the church. And she could protect herself from cockroaches and mosquitoes and whatever. And why does it have to be less than third world standards? The country's becoming terrible. But what could we do about it? Hi, my name is Jim Musselman. Uh, it's a question for both of you that I have, and uh, I appreciate 
the idea of regeneration. Um, but Gary Snyder talks about something called the growth monster. Last week I, I heard Ken Brower talk, and Ken Brower said he's 72. He said in his lifetime, the world's population has tripled. I wonder if you feel that dealing with population is something that we need to do to have this regeneration. We're going to answer all the yeah. questions at one time. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, thank you both for being here. And uh, Winona, I'm really intrigued uh, by this. Uh, HR 36. Uh, I really hope that it uh, succeeds and is uh, able to pass. Um, I, I actually had a question about this uh, that kind of speaks to uh, what I was presenting on uh, earlier this uh, over this weekend. Um, uh, corporations, uh, you know, like Monsanto, uh, Exxon Mobil, they're recognized as equal persons under the 14th Amendment, um, and there have been uh, several Supreme Court uh, cases uh, over local ordinances uh, that include environmental regulations uh, that were effectively overturned, uh, that overturned local ordinances because of, uh, because they treated uh, large multinational corporations uh, differently than the local companies uh, un and violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So I'm just curious to know um, if there has been consideration uh, in HR 36 uh, towards that uh, court precedent, and if not, uh, how can we make clear, uh, make sure that this applies uh, to everyone so that it, uh, corporations can't claim that right? Sure. I'll start with, uh, it's HR 3671. So uh, the bill does not deal with this local control issue, but I think it's a very important issue, and it's one that activists are working on at the state level. Some states have the ability for a local government to make a decision about zoning in their, uh, the boundaries of their county or city. And that has been defended uh, very successfully in some states like New York, for instance. In other states like Missouri, folks have just lost uh, local control. But this is an issue uh, because of the way our uh, constitution that is written that has to be fought out at the state level. But it's an extremely important issue. And it shows the true hypocrisy of the right wing who likes to say um, devolution, everything should be decided uh, at the local level, but they don't really mean that. That's just an excuse uh, to not do what they, they should do at the state or federal level. As far as the population issue goes, you know, I agree. Uh, we have um, a very large population. I think we have to be careful with how we deal with population issues and probably in the U.S. one of the best ways to fight for women's rights because we know that women benefit from having birth control and being able to decide how to limit their family. That's a woman's decision. We need to give women the ability to do that. And the reason that we've seen such a, um, a spurt of population in so many uh, global south countries is actually because corporations want to bring everybody into the dollar economy and they want a very large population and they've been behind in part uh, the political move to cut off the kind of birth control programs and other things that women need to make those decisions in their life. And this is not going to go anywhere good unless we are able to fight for those programs and make sure that they're funded. Because we know that uh, this is a very, uh, it's a, a matter of fairness. And, you know, I think the homeless issue, like all of our issues, it's about 
building the political power to uh, undo these policies and get rid of these bastards that are running our country and elect other people. And a lot of these decisions on how the homeless are treated are made at the local level. Or the, uh, so it, it, it's an issue that can be organized on by people uh, locally, and we all know it's easier to do things locally sometimes than it is uh, to change federal policy. Thank you. I'll just uh, add a couple things on the population issue. You know, it has uh, been, as Winona said, like it's just been shown by study after study the best way to deal with the population issue is to educate and empower women and girls. And when you do that, then when women have the power to make those choices, they make reasonable choices and you don't get huge bulges of population. Um, gosh, there were a number of questions. <laughs> Uh, the homeless, yeah. I mean, I think all of those are so bound up in, again, the question of what are our priorities as society? And we have this really vile right-wing voice constantly pumping into us that somehow anything that actually cares for people or for the earth or for the next generation is somehow a sign of like weakness or I don't know, coddling people or it's not like real strength like war and aggression and it shouldn't be what we're putting our money into. And unfortunately, people have bought into that and because of that, you know, we have lost a lot of things that we used to take for granted, even things like education and funding. I mean, when I, my generation, when we went to college in California, I went to UCLA in the 70s, it was free. You know? And it was just understood that state universities should be free to people who lived in that state. And now when you tell young people that, they're like, how could it possibly be free? Like, how can it, you know? How could we afford that? Well, we afforded that because corporations paid taxes. Right? Yeah. And they did that, you know, not even out of altruism or anything, but because it was understood that it's to everybody's benefit to educate the, your population. And we can see that now when we have a really badly educated population voting idiots into office. Uh, I'll also say I really like the economic um, programs that you've put forward. I think it, they're great things. And I agree that we have to work on all those levels. I like to think about activism as an ecosystem, and it's got all these niches that need to be filled. And, you know, so it's got that niche of working on legislation, and then it's got that niche of organizing big demonstrations, and it's got that niche of direct action. And I think we do better if instead of like, telling people like, my niche is better than your niche, you know, saying like, oh, how does my niche and your niche, how can they support each other and work together? And when we do that, we can really make some amazing changes. <laughs> and I wanted to also add into that the idea of divestment, uh, which the Standing Rock campaign against DAPL has done so effectively of getting people to pull money out of um, the corporations that are funding the oil and gas and making them bad investments. And I think that is proving to be very effective. And then along with that, um, putting investments into, putting resources into the things that we need and want. Because we need more resources you know, we need more resources for training the people to do all these regenerative things. Uh, we need more resources so that people who don't have a lot of money can afford to be trained in these things. 
Um, I love the idea of the Palace of Fine Arts as a regenerative center. I think that's beautiful and brilliant. <laughs> And I'll just also say, uh, one of my friends I just was with in Spain formed a cooperative energy company to get people to invest together and put their money together. And they are just about to put their first wind energy project into operation in October and start generating electricity. Uh, so we can also think about ways to pool resources and create the things that we need and want. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much to both. And you know, this plenary was going to be only women, but at the end, two, per, two people canceled. So because I really think that we, as men, we have always to listen to them first. And, and well, you know, they are not distracted. They are just more focused, smarter. They have more wisdom. They have more bigger heart, you know. And they give us life, you know. Without my mother, I wouldn't be here, you know. So, and I want to thank you for their work because it's amazing what they both are doing. And I am, I, every time when, when I read the book of, of Fusopoli, I feel very inspired. And when I hear all the, the, the comments of my friends about the books of Star Hawk, I, I get very impressed at how many followers she has everywhere. Everywhere I go, they talk about Star Hawk, you know? So they both are in different levels, you know? I, I see in one, some friends, I see that they talk more about Fracopoli or Fusopoli. In other friends, they are talking about Star Hawk, Star Hawk, Star Hawk. So it's so interesting for me. <laughs> so thank you so much again. And I want to remind you that we have a lot of squash. Please take it home. And after this breakout presentations, we're going to have a celebration with these bikes that are going to in the back that are going to power the music. So please welcome. Thank you again for everything you do. Thank you so much.